about it a little more. We talked about ATP transfer, transferring molecules. So the chemical bonds 
the way the chemical bonds are makes the shape of the molecules have more or less energy. They're able to do work like the piece of paper. No, this is chemistry, right? I mean, you do, but not in biology. They're just the, this class. I, I might. I mean, I could. I could say, you know, how, how would you get a reaction to go, you know? I mean, you need to know all this, right? So you could increase temperature, you could increase disorder, or you can decrease the energy in the chemical bonds. That's the three ways you can do it. So this, I mean, that's fair game, but, you know, in biology, you can't do this to get a reaction to go. The only thing you can do is this, which is decrease the energy in the bonds. And to do that, you have to bend the bonds, just like if you were breaking a pencil. You're decreasing the energy in the pencil, and therefore you're able to break it. So that causes this to go down. And how do we get the molecule to change its shape? Second most important thing in biology, it just told you. Add another molecule. It just so happens that phosphate is another molecule. So you add a phosphate to, you know, the bond or the chemical, and it bends it and makes it weaker and makes it, it become spontaneous. So the example that we used <coughs> was glutamine, which is right here. So this reaction would never occur because delta G is positive plus 3.4, right? In order for a reaction to be spontaneous, what does the delta G have to be? Negative. So it wouldn't matter what, what we did. This reaction, it wouldn't matter how long you sat and stared at a can of gasoline. It would never catch on fire unless it reached a certain threshold of heat, the temperature. Does that make sense? So this reaction would never occur in the body. How do we get it to go? We add a phosphate, right? This phosphate has 7.3 kilocalories. So that bends this enough to weaken it so that this value goes negative, right? Same thing with the gas, except that we're not changing the bonds by adding phosphates. We're messing with temperature, right? If I throw a match in there, it goes. That's because I've increased this which makes that go down. It's the same thing as setting gas on fire, burning paper, or whatever. All those reactions have to follow the same rule. And you could do this outside of the body, but you can't do it inside the body because that would mess up everything else. And we, we do this, like, if I want a reaction to go to copy DNA outside of the body, the easiest thing to do to get the DNA to separate is to increase the temperature. But inside the body, you can't do that. So what do you have to rely on? Changing the molecule, right? Changing the shape of the molecule. Or weakening the bonds. And we talked about ATP, right? ATP is important, it's your energy source. And ATP is like a spring a compressed spring. So if I have a compressed spring, I could put a ball on it and make it shoot there. That would do work, right? But if I have an uncompressed spring and I stick a ball on it, what does it do? Nothing. And I could stare at it for a hundred years and it wouldn't do anything. How do I get it to do that? Do something? I compress it again. Which is basically what ATP is. It's like a compressed spring. Does that make sense? <clears throat> and you use a massive amount of this. 10, 10 million ATP per second per cell. So remember, enzymes, they're proteins. I know that I'm backtracking, but that's okay. So enzymes are proteins, right? Proteins are made out of what? Amino acids, excellent. So enzymes are like workers in a factory, right? So if I worked in a factory, my job was to put the chip in the iPhone. Right? I put the processor, the A8 processor in it. That's all I do all day long. Just because I put the processor in doesn't mean that I can only do one and I'm tired and I'm going to quit. Right? Or I'm not becoming part of the phone. I'm just, a, I'm just a catalyst. Right? I'm speeding up the reaction. You could have some machine 
throwing chips in the air and it might eventually fall in the right position in the phone, right? But if I'm directing it, then that's going to go a lot faster. Does that make sense? So that's what enzymes do. They direct reactions. They direct putting, you know, stuff in the right place so that it has a reaction, so it does something. <clears throat> and all enzymes are catalysts, but not all catalysts are enzymes. So on my car, I have a catalyst. It's called a catalytic converter, and its job is to remove uh, pollutants that m my car produces from burning gas. So that speeds up a reaction too, but it's a metal, right? Enzymes are always proteins. And their job is to speed stuff up. So they're not consumed in the process. They don't lose their ability to do it. I mean, after a while, an enzyme will wear out because of the one of the laws of thermodynamics. Which one is that? That says everything wears out eventually. Yeah. So they're going to wear out just like we do. Just like cars do and buildings and everything else. Rock, even rocks. So that brings us back to where we're at now. So before I showed you guys this, this slide, right? And so this slide is a classic slide of what you do. You put food in your mouth and you breathe air and a reaction occurs and you give off carbon dioxide and water. Right? You know that. That's a reaction. So you know that the food that you eat has more energy than the stuff that you make out of it. Because one of the laws of thermodynamics says that you can't create or destroy energy. So what would be the purpose of eating food if it cost energy? Would there be one? No, you you would never benefit from doing that because there's more energy in the sugars and the oxygen than there is in the carbon dioxide and water. Then the reaction looks like this, where the reactants are have more potential energy, right? Because remember, what kind of energy is in chemical bonds? Is it kinetic or potential? It's potential, right? So this has high potential energy and this has lower potential energy. So the difference between these two is the output of energy, right? Where does that energy go when you're eating food and breathing air? What's your fuel? It gets converted into ATP, right? So this reaction is, is it spontaneous or non-spontaneous? It's spontaneous, right? The reactants have more energy in the product. So what does that mean the delta G is? It's negative. Yeah, and the delta G is simply the difference between the energy in the reactants and the energy in the products. That right there, that arrow is delta G. So we get it? Okay. So, and I equated this to a rock rolling downhill, right? Rocks roll downhill. So you don't have to put any energy in it. The rock's just rolling down the hill. So it's a spontaneous reaction. But you guys know that if there was a rock on top of a hill, it's not going to suddenly start rolling down the hill. What would have to happen? You'd have to push it a little bit, right? You have to put a little bit of energy in it to get it to go. So in reality, this is what it looks like, right? You have to put a little energy, and that energy we call energy of activation. Energy to kind of get the rock rolling. Once the rock starts rolling, there's no stopping it, right, Till it gets to the bottom of the hill. Does that make sense? So what enzymes do is they mess with the amount of energy you have to put in to get it, the rock to start going, right? So enzymes lower the energy of activation, this EA, so that you don't have to put as much energy into the initial start of the reaction. Does that make sense? Enzymes don't change delta G. Right? They only change EA. Because think about it. This is the enzyme, right? The kinase is transferring the phosphate. If the kinase, if the phosphate came from the kinase to do this, right, to bend the bond, then it would be contributing to the change in delta G, right? But is the enzyme giving the phosphate? 
Where's the phosphate come from? So ATP is changing delta G. So on the test, if I ask you, there's a, you know, a chemical reaction whose delta G is plus 20, you add an enzyme into it, what's the new delta G? Well, I said 20. No, it's, it's, it's still 20, right? It's still plus 20. <laughs> Maybe you didn't hear what I said. No, I was listening. Yeah, so if, if I say there's a reaction, right? The delta G is plus 20. I add an enzyme. What happens to delta G? And I might ask you, does it go up? Does it go down? Does it stay the same? And the correct answer is, this will be the same no matter what, because what enzymes change? Not delta G, what do they change? Right. The energy of activation. Energy of activation. Or activation energy. It's a, it's a little bit of energy you have to put in to get the reaction to start. Right. Yeah, it's like the it's like you pushing it until it starts rolling. Then you don't you can just watch stand back and watch the destruction you've just unleashed. Right? But that rock's not gonna start rolling until you overcome that little bit of friction that's holding it in place. And that's what energy of activation is like. That's the best way I can describe it. Um the transition state is when you no longer have to put any more energy. You can just watch the rock roll down the hill, right? You can, the reaction started. Once it started, once the gasoline starts burning, you can stand back, right? You don't have to do anything. It's going to keep burning until what? It's all burnt, right? And that's it. Then the reaction stops. So that's what, you don't have to put any energy. But you have to add a little energy to get it to go. Like the match. Make sense? kind of confusing, but you'll just have to accept it. <laughs> All right. So on the test, I might show you a graph just like this, except I won't put what it is. I'll put the arrows, and I'll ask you what it is. So you'll see this. I'll have free energy on one side. I'll ask you, what kind of reaction is this? Is this spontaneous or non-spontaneous? Remember the rule? Spontaneous, the reactants have more energy than the products. Yeah. So this is a spontaneous reaction, that's correct. What What is the difference between this black line and this red line? Right. Enzymes are added to make this one red because this is the, it lowers the energy of activation. So what is this? This is the energy that's required without an enzyme. This is the energy that's required with an enzyme. It's less. Did it change delta G? Did the enzyme change delta G? Because delta G is the energy, the difference between the reactants and the products. Remember, shape is the most important thing in biology, and enzymes are, are really specific about the shape that they have. So if we change the shape of an enzyme, what happens to it? Does it work as well? No. And enzymes are specific for what they react on, right? So there's an enzyme called sucrase that reacts on the sugar sucrose. There's an enzyme called lactase. It reacts on the sugar lactose. There's an enzyme called amylase that we messed with in lab. It reacts on amylose. So sucrase would never react with lactase and amylase would never react with sucrase, you know, sucrose, sorry. So the enzymes are really specific for what they react on. And so we talk about an enzyme and what it reacts on is the, what we call a substrate. So that's just a term you need to know. So if we have the enzyme sucrase, what's its substrate? Sucrose. 
If we have the enzyme lactase, what's its substrate? If we have the enzyme amylase, amylase, all enzymes end in ASE. So in biology, you, every time you see the ASE on the end, you know immediately it's an enzyme. Okay? And usually the name tells you what it reacts with. All right, so here's an example. Sucrase breaks up sucrose. Sucrose is actually glucose and fructose together. So this enzyme breaks down table sugar, and you have it in your body, and that's its job. When you eat sugar, that's what reacts with it. Is it amylase? No, because amylase only reacts with amylose, the carbohydrates, or, or things that are closely related to Okay, so this blue thing here is called a hexokinase, and I've showed you guys this before. In fact, I'll just back up. So, remember this chart that I showed you? And all these black dots are enzymes. So here's glucose. The enzyme that reacts on glucose directly is a hexokinase. It's the first thing in this reaction. And its job is to remember what a kinase does? So that's what it did, right? It added a phosphate. So this molecule is called glucose 6 phosphate. Why do you think it's called 6 phosphate? It's on the number six carbon, right? And we could count it one, two, three, four, five, six. Ta da! It did its job correctly. <clears throat> Alright, so let's jump forward. Alright, so this blue molecule right here is. Hexokinase right here, and it adds a phosphate. Here's the what it reacts with. What do we call this? Right, it's called glucose, but what is its term when it's react? It's a substrate. Good. So you will. This is a space filling model. So if you could shrink yourself down and look at the enzyme, you would see this is what it looks like. It's this three dimensional shape. This is what glucose looks like. See how much bigger the enzyme is? It's massive compared to the, what it's reacting on. There's lots of other parts to this enzyme that can do other things. Glucose binds into this area we call the active site. This is the site that performs the reaction. Right? So when glucose binds, when any molecule binds to another molecule, what does it do? So what, what happened here? See how it closed? So we call that the induced fit model because it, when, it, when it binds, it's induced to fit better. And so we get a reaction, right? We can physically, you know, if you're building a model, you would physically have to push things together, right? What do you think a molecule doing that's going to do? It physically can push things together. And you'll see that later on. So what, what's the goal? We want to physically put a phosphate onto that molecule. And that's what it does. And, and this is called the lock and key hypothesis because the molecule shape and the enzyme shape, the substrate shape and the enzyme shape are very critical. If I change either one of those, it won't work. Just like if I put super glue in the lock in your house, would it work? Your key? No. Because I changed the shape, right? And if I took your key and rubbed it on the ground for 45 minutes, would it work in the lock? No, probably not. So enzymes are specific, just like a key is specific for a lock. So you can think of that as the enzyme substrate. And in fact, it's called the lock and key hypothesis, which I don't know why it's a hypothesis, because it should be called the lock and key fact. All right, so this is out of your book, and it's just showing you you know, I showed you that real three-dimensional thing, but this is kind of the artist's rendition of it. So here we have sucrose. 
Remember when we want to break a bond, the reaction is always the same. So what do we have to do if we want to break some, a bond? Add water. What do we call that? Hydrolysis. Excellent. So indeed, we have to add water here. So the enzyme, shown here in purple, here's the active site where it binds, right? Here's where the reaction is going to occur on this bond to break it apart. And so remember, enzymes are proteins, right? And proteins have R groups. And remember, the R groups have different categories. So they have, we can have acidic and basic, or we could have them charged, positive and negative, or we could have them hydrophobic or hydrophilic. So what kind of R groups do you think are in that active site to get water to go in there to re perform a reaction? Which one? Hydrophobic. So hydrophobic would scare water away, wouldn't it? So you want to attract water, right? You don't want to scare it away. So what kind of R groups would you have? Hydrophilic. And that's how the reaction occurs. If you wanted to build the molecule up, right, there's enzymes that do that too, what kind of R groups would you want in there? Hydrophobic, because it would scare the water out of the molecule, which is what you guys basically had to do when you built the chemistry models. You just don't remember because it was so long ago. But you did, I promise. So that's why these R groups are important, because if something was screwed up here, if a mutation occurred and this was no longer a hydrophilic, but it was hydrophobic, do you think this would ever attract water? No way, okay? So the molecule's broken and the enzyme is reset, right? So the enzyme can do this reaction over and over and over and over and over again. And that's why it's a, called a catalyst. It's not used up and it doesn't become part of the reaction in, in itself. So our group is on the enzyme, remember? So amino acids, we'll, just, we'll go back and do a little refresher. So remember, proteins are made out of amino acids, and amino acids look like this, you know, carboxylic acid, hydrogen, and then the R group, and there's 20 different ones. And I told you guys didn't have to memorize those, right, but you needed to know the six types. So they're plus, minus, uh, acidic, basic. So you got, remember, I mean, we're looking at the space filling model, but if you shrunk yourself down and look, there were, the molecule itself would look like this, right? And it has lots of R groups. So, you know, carbon here and amino and carboxyl, and it, they would all be linked together to make this have that shape. And all these R groups would be sticking out there. And so you would want R groups that attracted water if you wanted them have an active site that broke bonds, right? And they, they can do all kinds of other things. So uh, there's a molecule that has to copy DNA and it has to bind to it, right? So what do you think the R groups that bind to DNA are out of this, these choices? That was a good guess. Because DNA's got a charge on it. What's its charge? Negative. And positive is attracted to negative. If the R groups were negative, it would never bind the DNA, so it would never be able to copy it. Does that make sense? So that's why the R groups are really important, and mutations in them can really screw stuff up. Not only because they don't have the shape, but they don't have the right chemistry either. <clears throat> Enzymes are made of proteins, and proteins are made of amino acids. Yep. So, by default, enzymes are made out of amino acids. That's correct. Exactly. 
and it's the order of the R groups that make it have its shape and make it have its chemistry. So this slide just talks about, you know, interactions. They hold the molecules there. They might bring in water. There might be a microenvironment where you need to change in pH, right? Change in shape or something to cause a reaction to occur. So all of this depends on that, that environment that the R groups provide in the active site of the enzyme. And we can change the rate of reaction. So you guys did this in the lab, right? We took amylase, the enzyme that breaks down amylose, and what did it produce? Do you remember? In lab, when we used amylase and it broke down, it, it broke it into maltose, that's right. And so you guys detected that. And what did you find out? The more enzyme you add, the faster the reaction goes. So this is no different than, say, like you're running a business and you have a factory of people that are assembling, let's say, an iPhone or whatever phone that you have. So, you know, you're going to need parts to build the phone, right? So you can think of the enzymes as the workers and the substrate as the parts. Does that make sense? So if you want to make more phones, you could increase the number of workers, which is what you guys did. But at some point, if you only have enough parts to build 10 phones an hour and you have 10 million workers in your factory, are you going to build, they're only going to be able to build so many phones for the parts you give them. So how do you overcome that? Yeah, you increase the parts that they have, right? Or let's say you had 10 workers and you had 6 billion, enough parts to make 6 billion phones. Could 10 workers build 6 billion phones? So how do you get it, how do you increase your production? Add more enzyme, right? Add more workers. So you can mess with this uh, by doing a fact. We talked a little bit about this. And I like to use this example because it's a <laughs> it's a really great classic biology example that that uh, was a good business model for a company called Monsanto. So you guys, we talked about Roundup. You spray it on your weeds and it kills them. And how does that work? You remember? I tell, tell you guys this? All right, well, I'll tell uh, If I have it, then if I have, it'll be a refresher. And if I have it, then you know, we'll see how Roundup works. So what do plants make for photosynthesis? Think about the equation, right? They make sugars, right? They don't, they can't make anything else. They can't, where would they get proteins from? You know, I mean, it's not like plants are running around eating stuff. I mean, some plants do, but it's for the nitrogen. It's not. It's a synthesized protein. So plants, they have glucose. And if they want to make proteins, they have to make amino acids. And what, the, what can turn one molecule into another? What are the workers? Yeah. So in plants, there's a series of enzymes. I'm not going to give you all the names because it's not really that relevant. But these workers, their job is to convert glucose, so it's gonna, they're going to break molecules, rearrange them, and they're going to make based on their shape. So, you know, I could just, I'll, I'll just pretend that enzyme looks like that, right? So the substrate would be, well, you guys know glucose is a hexagon, so I'll make it that. So our, our hexagon of glucose would fit in there, right? A reaction would occur, it would rearrange the molecule to make it a different shape. So let's say, you know, I don't really know what the shape is, but let's just say it's a circle. So now this enzyme fits that. 
and we can go on. Let's say this one's a triangle. So this would go over here, and the triangle would fit in it, and so on and so forth until we get the amino acid. Right? Does that make sense? Okay. So when you spray Roundup on weeds or whatever, that Roundup has a chemical called glyphosate. You don't need to know this. That chemical has the same shape as what goes from B to C. So it can park in that spot, right? Like, let's say that you're in a rush and you go to the target and you park in the employee of the month spot. Can the employee of the month park there now? No. And the same thing, if glyphosate parks in the active site of this enzyme, then this can't park in it. So what happens? Right, this shuts down and the plants can't make amino acids and if they can't make amino acids, they can't make proteins and without proteins, they're nothing, they're dead. Because they need these to make the enzymes to do the reaction. Does that make sense? So, but, so Monsanto discovered this. And, and this, right, this Roundup chemical right there makes them about three to four billion dollars a year. Just by discovering that. But they didn't stop there. What they did was they developed plants that were resistant to the weed killer so that farmers could grow corn and spray it all over their corn crops and all it would do is kill the weeds it wouldn't kill the corn how did they do that so remember plants have that already they need that you can't change the shape of it think about the workers in a factory right Think about parking spots. So let's say that there's 10 C enzymes in a plant and you spray 10 glyphosates. That means that 10 people have taken the 10 available employee of the month spots. So how would you get the employee of the month to have another parking spot if they're all taken? At another spot, right? So you can make this 20 right you just add more genes that make C and now even though you're spraying it on there you still have 10 free spots that can do this does that make sense so you've just increased the amount of enzyme it's the same thing we just talked about right you want to under overcome it add more workers into the factory this is what people talk about when they're talking about genetically modified crops people are scared of it right because it's going to kill you but it's already there. What does that do? Isn't it? it? It's already there. You already eat it. But You're it just eating more of it. Now. Yeah. That doesn't affect how it digests in your body. No. This is, a, this is a protein, right? It'll never make it past your stomach. That's why people have to take insulin injections because it's a protein. You can't eat it because your stomach will digest it into individual amino acids. So people are scared of it because it's weird, right? But the plant already has it. It already has C's. You just add more C's. So if people had allergies to this, they would already be allergic to plants because all plants have to have this. Does that make sense? They can't. <laughs> but they would, if they had an allergy to a GMO, they'd have to have an allergy to a plant. Right, so there's a BT one. Right, which is that's different. So BT is from a bacteria, and they've taken the gene from that, and that's an insecticide and that kills the insects on it. That's different than this kind of GMO. So you would never, well, you might get this bacteria, by, but it lives in the dirt, right? So if you ate dirt, you might get exposed to that chemical. But this one should be completely safe, right? Or you guys don't believe me? Does that change the shape though? Of the what? Does that change the shape of like the... Because it does, it's extra on the spot, not the spot, so that's not changing the shape of the 
just these just get taken out. It would be like if I had ten workers in the factory and I just pulled them all out. All right, you can't work anymore today. But I have ten other ones to replace them because I've added more genes. If I didn't have the extra genes, the factory would get shut down. sort of argument where people would make saying I don't want to vaccinate my kids because the mercury in the vaccine uh, has an effect there's no scientific study that's ever shown that not one So, 
we talked about things that change the activity of an enzyme. You guys know that there's two things, major things that change the shape of an enzyme. What is that? Temperature and pH. Exactly. So all things, uh, all, most all organisms have the enzyme amylase, right? And that's found in your saliva. So what do you think the temperature that it works best at is? Body temperature, right? But guess what? Crabs at the bottom of the ocean have amylase too. What do you think their enzyme works best at? Which is? Which is? Four. Exactly, four degrees Celsius. And mushrooms that live in the forest, right? Like let's say it in at 70 degrees or whatever, they have amylase too. They break down uh, starch. So, what do you think theirs works best at? Right, whatever, you know, we just call that room temperature. But you guys get the idea, right? And the enzyme is the same. If you looked at a crab's amylase enzyme at four degrees, it would have this shape. If you looked at your amylase enzyme at four degrees, it would have the exact same shape. No, sorry, your enzyme at 37 Celsius, which is 98.6, have the same shape. But if you cooled yours down to the temperature of a crab's, would it have the same shape then? No. Or if you heated up a crab's to your body temperature, would it have the same shape? No. So at, over time, these organisms have evolved these enzymes that have a specific shape at a specific temperature that makes it work. So you could never take a crab's enzyme and put it in your body and expect it to work because it wouldn't have the same shape because it, unless you were outside at four degrees. Does that make sense? Same thing with pH, right? So here's uh, an example. Here's an enzyme uh, that would copy your DNA. And we're going to use this later on in one of the labs that I wrote. So the optimal temperature for this is body temperature, which is 37 Celsius, 98.6, what you guys think. This is an enzyme that's found at a hot springs in Yellowstone, a thermo, uh, uh, heat tolerant, thermal stable, thermophilic, heat loving bacteria. And that, uh, its optimal temperature, what it lives at is 72 degrees Celsius, which is pretty close to boiling. It's pretty high. Do you think your enzyme would work at that temperature? Would their enzyme work to copy DNA? So whenever we copy DNA in a test tube, we're going to use this enzyme. So what do you think we're going to heat it to to get the enzyme to work best? 72 degrees. Does that make sense? Here's the, These are enzymes that break down uh, proteins. This one's found in your mouth, which has a pH of about 8, 8.2. This one's found in your stomach that has a pH of about 2. So would this, would pepsin work to break down proteins in your mouth? No. Would trypsin work to break down proteins in your stomach? No. So everything has an optimal temperature and an optimal pH. On the test, I'll put a graph something like this and I'll ask you what is the optimal temperature of this red enzyme? So you can just look at where's the peak at. Right. What's the optimal temperature for this? What's the optimal pH for that? And so on and so forth. So basically you just have to read a graph. Or I might ask you about the crab question. I love that one. Because you should already know that the bottom of the ocean is what temperature? Four degrees. Because you learned that in chapter three. Okay. So, you guys know that enzymes have an active site, right? And that the substrate fits in there like we like I put on the board. So, changing pH or temperature changes the shape of that, and so it no longer can fit. So, we no longer have a function. But, like glyphosate, you can have things that are blocking that active site. And so, we call that competitive inhibition because it's inhibiting this enzyme's function by competing for that active site. Does that make sense? And that's shown right here. So if there's some, this black molecule's in the way, this blue molecule can't fit, 
even though it has the right shape. You guys can see it's drawn the same as that. So there's lots of drugs that work this way, right? Like uh, pain receptor blockers. They bind into the site for pain so that you no longer have pain or anti-inflammatory molecules bind in there and inhibit inflammation and so on and so forth. So lots of drugs work this way. And remember, I don't have to directly block the active site. If I add another molecule to the enzyme, what is it going to do to the enzyme? Change its shape, right? And that shape could affect the active site. So even if I bind something that's not directly in it, somewhere off to the side, it can change the shape so this no longer fits. So we call that a non-competitive inhibitor. And drugs work that way too. As long as it changes the shape of the active site, it can no longer function. Does that make sense? Right, so, so if we're talking about cofactors, which I haven't got to yet, but that's on the top of the screen, the cofactor is an inorganic molecule, which means that it's not carbon-based. Right, so examples of a co, so a cofactor is something that actually makes the enzyme work. It's opposite of an inhibitor, because without a cofactor, the enzyme can't function. A good example of this is, remember we talked about the enzyme in the lysosome? lysosome? called RNase and DNase. So DNase can't chop up DNA unless it has a cofactor. It doesn't have the right shape. That cofactor is magnesium. So when we try to isolate DNA out of your cheek cells, we have to try to take away the magnesium so that that enzyme won't cut up the DNA because we want to copy the DNA. Does that make sense? The enzyme that copies your DNA it won't have the right shape unless it magnesium's present. So you will have to add magnesium into the reaction to make it work. And that's what a cofactor is. So a cofactor is something that allows the enzyme to function. Without the cofactor, it will not work. So zinc, magnesium, stuff like that. Trace minerals allow it to function. And if they're more complex, like vitamins, right? So if you look at vitamins, those are considered organic because they have a lot of carbons and hydrogens and stuff like that in it. So vitamins are what we call coenzymes because they're bigger molecules, but they work the same way. Without the coenzyme, if a enzyme requires a coenzyme, it won't have the right shape and it won't function correctly. So the reason that you need vitamins is to, power, to make your enzymes have the right shape to function. That's it. Otherwise, you wouldn't need vitamins. You wouldn't get scurvy or any of this other stuff because your enzymes would be able to function. Does that make sense? So if I ask you on the test, what does a cofactor do? You're going to tell me that it's an inorganic molecule that allows an enzyme to function. Or I might ask you, what happens if there's no cofactor for the enzyme? What's the end result? Would it work a little bit? No, it doesn't work at all. Without it, it won't function. All right, so cofactors make them work, inhibitors make them not work. Did we get it? All right, so you can control the enzyme's activity by changing the shape of the active site. So here we can have what we call an allosteric site. It's a, it's a region it's kind of like uh, where we have a non-competitive inhibition, but here we have an enzyme that has multiple subunits. What do we call protein that has multiple subunits? What, what form is that? Yeah, you're close. It's quaternary. That's right. So these are quaternary. These are special types of enzymes that have multiple active sites because they have multiple subunits. So you have a, a area that's not within the active site. 
that molecules can bind to to change its shape. So it can be active or inactive. Can we see that? So allosteric enzymes can have a molecule like an activator that binds here and opens it up so it makes it function, right? Or you can have a molecule that's an inhibitor that binds here and shuts it down. And that's important because your body wants to be able to regulate what it does. So, for example, if you guys aren't drinking milk, do you need to have an active lactase enzyme? No. So, in that case, what would you want to happen if you drink milk sugar? You'd want to be able to activate the enzyme, right? So in this case, the sugar in milk's an activator. So lactose binds here, opens up the active site, so you're drinking milk, right? And what it does is it breaks down lactose. So you only need one lactose molecule to allow this to break down tens of thousands of lactose molecules, right? Because the enzyme can keep reacting. And the opposite effect would be, uh, you guys know that you can synthesize amino acids. If you don't, you can. One of those amino acids is tryptophan. So let's say that you, most people know this, so let's say you just sat down to Thanksgiving dinner and you ate a bunch of turkey. So you're going to load your body with what? Amino acid? Tryptophan. So do you need to synthesize it then? So in that case, if you're eating tryptophan, what would you want to do to the enzymes that make tryptophan? and activate them, right? So in this case, tryptophan is an inhibitor of the enzymes that make tryptophan. So it, this is what we call feedback, and it can be positive or negative. And you can have something called cooperativity, where you have a substrate that binds into the active site, which is different, right, because the allosteric one was off of the active site. And this binding blocks this up, right? But you have three others that can function. So it's still allowing this to, to work. This wouldn't work if it was if it didn't have a quaternary structure. So here's another example of feed back inhibition. This is another amino acid, a three anine amino acid. It binds to the active side of this enzyme, which does a series of things just like this that makes, it turns it into another amino acid. So it's just replacing the R group. And the end product here is isoleucine. So if you have isoleucine, do you need to make more isoleucine? Then what do you want to do to this these enzymes, this pathway? You want to inhibit it, right? So isoleucine binds here, changes the shape of the active site so that it no longer functions. So what kind of inhibitor is isoleucine in this pathway. This isn't ha this is just a single enzyme. It doesn't have multiple sides. So remember there's two kind of inhibitors. There's competitive and non-competitive inhibitors. Which one is this? Non-competitive, why? It's not binding in the active site. It's binding somewhere else that changes its shape. That's exactly right. So on the test, I might ask you, you know, is this competitive or non-competitive inhibition, and why? All right. End of chapter eight. Questions? Right. So, right. So your bo your body would reuptake that, but since it can't, then it affects the receptors. Yeah, exactly. Mm
Okay, so this is the last chapter before your exam, which is scheduled on the 4th, but I may move it to the 6th, just so you guys are aware. All right, I haven't decided yet, but we'll see. Um, so, yeah. This one's, I can turn on because it's not blinking, but this one's blinking, so I can't turn this on right now. So anyway, while I'm waiting for this thing to cool off or whatever it's doing, uh, well, let's talk about your test. So the test will be in the same format, except it'll be less questions. So it's going to be 50 because there's less chapters. There's only four. So it's going to cover chapter six, which is the tour of the cell. Chapter seven, which is the membranes. Chapter eight, which we just covered, which is metabolism. And that includes the enzymes and ATP. And then this chapter, which is cellular respiration. And so, same format, number two pencil, green Scantron, periodic table if you want, or you can use that one, um, and a calculator, but it has to be non-programmable and non-graphing. You don't have what? I'll go to the dollar store and I'll buy you one. They sell them there. <laughs> In fact... Here, you can have one. This is, this is, I actually paid 50 cents for this calculator. Dollars. You can pick it up later. <laughs> I'll leave it right there. All right, any other questions? No? Okay, so this talks about what we do when we're doing the reactions of respiration. So you guys probably know this equation by now, hopefully. What do we take in to make ATP? So, so what's the reaction? It's the opposite of photosynthesis. We take in glucose and combine that with or non-spontaneous reaction? Do these have more energy than this? Is it is it endergonic or exergonic? Remember, exo is to give off, endo is to take in. So it's an exergonic because it gives off energy in the form of ATP. Plants do the exact opposite, right? They take water and carbon dioxide and they make sugar and they give off oxygen. What kind of reaction is that? Spontaneous or non-spontaneous? Non-spontaneous because the reactants have less energy than the products. So how do we get the reaction to go? What's the, what, what, so what kind of reaction is it? Endergonic or exergonic? Endergonic. Where does the energy come from? Sunlight. So everybody get it? What's the delta G on photosynthesis? Positive or negative? What's the delta G on respiration? Negative. Good. So <clears throat> the whole point of this is to release the energy out of these bonds and, and move them onto ATP. Because the law of thermodynamics says that energy can't be created or destroyed, it can only change form. Which law is that? First. Excellent. So, law of thermodynamics says that we have to take the energy out of here and do something with it. So we can, it can be released as heat, it can be released as something else, but what we're doing is we're converting it into what kind of energy is in ATP? Kinetic or potential? Potential, because it's still a chemical and the energy is in the bonds, right, and the phosphates, the bonds and the phosphates, very good, so ATP, we said this in the last chapter, it's used 
to transport molecules. What's the example that we used for this active transport? Sodium potassium pump, excellent. Remember we added the phosphate, it changes its shape and allowed it to go against the gradient. So this is high concentration to low, right? Which would be that's this is that's drawn wrong. I'm gonna have to write them. It should be low to high because we need it to pump. And then mechanical work. So add a phosphate to motor proteins and you can get your muscles to move. Or we talked about in chemistry we can add a phosphate and reduce the what is it what is adding a phosphate reduce in the delta G reaction? It lowers delta H, right? What's delta H stand for? What do we call it? Enthalpy makes you guys know that. What's delta S? What's T? Good. What if I add, what if I said delta H is the heat energy in a system? Would that be right? True or false? No. What is it? Delta H. What's it called? Enthalpy. Good. All right. So we use ATP for everything, and this is like a mystical arrow. Do you think this just happens? There's like, remember all those workers I showed you that have to be involved in this to make this occur? So this whole chapter is dedicated to what is that magic arrow? What's involved in it? How does this reaction occur? And it's really complicated. But to make it basic, you guys know that the sun shines energy on plants and plants take sunlight and water and carbon dioxide and they make sugars, right? And then you guys eat the sugars and breathe air and then you do the opposite. So you're releasing the energy and they're putting the energy in. So this is just showing you that plants make organic molecules. You know, they, they, they not only make glucose, but they also make they also make proteins, right? And they also make lipids. And all those you can use for energy. They're all on your nutritional label. They all have calories, right? So all those organic molecules we can use for energy. But we're just going to focus on glucose because this is the rawest form of energy. Everything else has to get processed a little bit. Um, so that goes through the mitochondria, which you guys know. And the mitochondria's job is to make ATP. So some, almost all the energy is made into ATP, but you know that ener every energy conversion leads to what? What law of thermodynamics says that it leads to something else? Every time we do an energy conversion, it leads to disorder, right? What do we call disorder? Entropy. And what law of thermodynamics says that? Second law. So, we can't convert all the energy out of this into ATP. We're always going to lose some. And the, what we lose is that random form of energy, the worst, wasteful, most wasteful form of energy, which is random molecules moving, which is what? Heat. Okay. So, we lose some as heat, and then we give off carbon dioxide and the plants take it in and so on and so forth. And the sun keeps powering this reaction. It can't just go forever on its own because, because of the second law of thermodynamics. So there's two pathways that you can follow here. One is fermentation and the other one is respiration. Fermentation occurs in the absence of oxygen and respiration occurs in the presence of oxygen. And you guys can do both, right? If you hold your breath, you'll, uh, you'll start making ATP using fermentation, but you only make two ATP. But if you breathe air, you make 36. Bacteria can make 38. Why do you think that is? Because they're better than us. All right. So that's enough.
You guys had enough? Alright. So we'll pick this up on Tuesday. Have a good weekend. Come and get your free calculator while they last, while supplies last. <laughs>